This will be the chapter lecture for chapter seven, painting. So at the beginning of ever, every chapter, there are a list of learning objectives. So this one is basically knowing, you know, pigment, binder, vehicle, and the support in paintings. Know a little bit about the medium of watercolor and why artists use it. Also the process of creating a fresco, the technique of encaustic, know a little bit about those things. Know a little bit about the tempera medium, oil paint, acrylic paint. Contemporary innovations of supports for paint and tools. So we'll just get started right now. So drawing and painting are related processes and drawing is often done before you start painting. So you'll draw first and then apply paint over the top of the drawing. And paint strokes often resemble drawing techniques. So the first piece we're going to look at is by Gerard Richter. It's called Abstract Painting from 1984. It's actually oil on canvas. It's kind of not super big, 17 inches by 23 and 5 eighths. So this painting kind of shows us a lot of the different types of application you can do with paint. So he kind of invented this landscape almost that suggests rugged forms in the foreground and then an open distant sky. So large brush strokes of thickly applied oil paint are in the foreground here, which suggests mountains or trees. And then in the background, we have the smooth gradation of tone in the sky area, which shows us some range of textures possible with the medium. So this is more actual brush strokes, very thickly applied paint, creates a lot more texture. And then this is more subtly and smoothly blended. So there's some contrast there in, in the actual texture in this piece. I actually have an earlier piece of his from 1982, and it's a candle basically, but he used to do these highly photorealistic pictures. So this actually looks like a painting of a blurred candle or blurry photo of a candle, but it's actually a painting. But he eventually moves into more from photorealism paintings to more abstract paintings, like the one we just viewed earlier. So we'll talk about the ingredients of paint and also the surfaces. So um, paints consist of three ingredients. So the pigment, the binder, and the vehicle. So the pigment is any coloring agent. So this is where the color comes from. Made from natural or synthetic substances. Um, the binder is the material in, used in the paint that actually makes the particles stick together or adhere to one another. So that would be more of like a fat based thing typically. And then the vehicle is a liquid, which is actually used to kind of carry the paint or spread the paint around. So the pigments, the first one on the list here, we're going to talk about those, those provide the color. Those are the actual ground mineral that you might find that have the color in them. It's usually a fine powder that you bind it, you know, they get grinded down into a fine powder. A good pigment, you know, must be stable while drying and it must resi res resist fading over time. So we're going to take a look at some of these cave paintings in Pointe d'Arc, France. So people who made the earliest cave paintings used natural pigments obtained from plants and nearby deposits of minerals and clays. So they actually got their blacks from charred wood. And also they have a few colors in here. They're kind of hard to identify, but they're typically very earthy, like browns and maybe slightly reddish brown. Um, those are earth colors, typically iron oxides found in the earth. There's other different types of pigment that you can find that are blue or green, but they don't have a lot of that in this area. So it's mostly um, more orangey type colors, but you can see they did an amazing job uh, with the pigments that they used and they've lasted 30,000 years. So, and that's just the charcoal from the fire there. So ground minerals and dried plant juices were often commonly used in many of the natural pigment sources in ancient times. And more exotic pigments have included powdered animal urine and even dried insect blood. So we're going to talk about the binder now. Um, it's a sticky substance that holds the pigment particles together and attaches the pigment to the surface. So it actually helps it to stick really. And 
Um, they vary with the type of paint you use. So oil paint, for example, uses linseed oil um, and tempera paint uses egg yolk. Before the advent of tubes for oil paint in the 19th century, painters and their assistants had to make their own paint. So they would have to finely ground down the pigments, which were usually in chunks of rock like uh, they would be like, ch you know, chunks of dirt, basically, that you'd have to grind down until you got to desirable fineness and consistency. And then you'd had to add your binder and your liquid, so to create your own paints. But now tubes for oil paint and other types of paint are available that you can just buy this off the shelf. So they're actually, that really helped to change painting a lot. And artists were actually able to go outside and take their paints with them. So after the advent of tubes with paint in them, you know, you could just buy, you could actually take your paints outside. And so that really kind of changed painting in that a lot of artists were doing that and you were getting more paintings that were of the outdoor scenes. So moving on, vehicles make a paint more of a liquid and can be added for further thinning. So turpentine, turpentine in oils is the vehicle, and then water is the vehicle in watercolor. And then paint surfaces require a support or structure to hold them. So either a wood panel to paint on, a stretched canvas that you might paint on, or paper are common supports. So it's basically whatever the painting is done on is called a support. And many supports require sealing, which lessens their absorptive quality and smooths the surface of the support. The sealant is called usually sizing or size and is generally made from liquid clay, wax, or glue and over the sizing or instead of the sizing, um, artists might use just a primer, which is usually white, just to create a uniform colored surface of white um, that helps create a good ground for painting. So there are some prep work that artists have to do to a surface before they begin painting. And that mostly has to do with the sizing, which seals the surface and keeps it from absorbing the paint too much. And then the primer is typically added on top of that to create a nice white color to paint on. So the support is the structure beneath the painting, must be sealed with sizing and primer for a uniform surface. So, so we're gonna talk about watercolor as our first type of paint, basically. Pigments are mixed with water as a vehicle and then gum arabic as the binder. So gum arabic is actually a sap from a tree. And the most common support today for watercolor is made from cotton paper because it's got really good absorbency and longevity. And watercolor was traditionally sold in solid blocks of dried block where you'd actually take your water and mix it on top. But now it's actually today, since we have those tubes, it's, it's sold in, in a tube form and you can still add water into it. Um, in the tube form. And then when, with working with watercolor, the paint is applied in thin translucent washes that allow light to pass through the layers of color. So washes are used a lot. Highlights are obtained by leaving areas of white paper unpainted. Opaque or non-translucent watercolor is sometimes added on top after the wash is dried for extra detail. So watercolor is a demanding medium because the materials used do not permit for easy changes or corrections. So you can't just erase it or paint over it. Um, it's easy to overwork. So if you go over it a lot and try to perfect it, it oftentimes will lose its freshness and spontaneity. Watercolors are really good for painting outdoor scenes because it's just the water is easy to clean with. It's easy to take with you. So this, we're going to take a look at a piece by Winslow Homer called Boys Waiting. And watercolor is really great for depicting water, atmosphere, light, and weather because of that wash type quality. You can, you can really layer the washes on top of each other, the washes of color. So here's a piece by Winslow Homer, Boys Waiting, 1873. Watercolor and gouache over graphite on woven paper. So this is by Winslow Homer. He's quite a famous artist and he worked with watercolors often. And the boys in the water seem quickly sketched and the background shapes are flatter, which reflects how things further away appear to our eyes under bright light. 
So there's a little bit less detail in the background as well. So a little bit of atmospheric perspective going on. The water in the foreground shoreline are quickly brushed with mostly horizontal strokes. And in order to capture the dappled surface of the water, Homer used strokes of analogous colors. So using colors from the color wheel that are all in the same area of the color wheel. So Homer created highlights on the water after the first layer of washes had dried by applying opaque watercolor, also known as gouache. So we see these strokes most clearly on the left near the shoreline. So right here, you can really see those strokes made with a gouache. And gouache's watercolor was small amounts of white chalk powder added to create that opaqueness that we see. So moving on, we're going to talk about traditional Chinese watercolor techniques. And in China, watercolor is descended from the art of calligraphy, and calligraphy in China is a really big deal. They have a huge alphabet, highly skilled craftspeople working on calligraphy in China. So watercolor is kind of descended from calligraphy. So they use a lot of just black. They don't use very much color. They might use a little bit of color. And so the, piecing, the piece that we're going to look at is by Lashida or Lishida, Five Deer Hermitage, and it's from the early 17th century, and it's ink and color on gold fleck paper, so it's 12 and a half by 24 inches, and this is a great example of traditional Chinese painting that uses both ink and watercolor. So he used the ink for the black areas, such as the roof lines, and then he used the watercolor to add blue and green, so in the foliage. And he also used really small brush strokes in some of this, which he learned by making calligraphy. And we can see these small brush strokes most clearly in the foliage of the trees here. So it's kind of a mixed piece with um, some color, but mostly done in black. I guess we can talk about fresco here in the remaining time that we have. So true fresco pigments are suspended in water and then applied to damp lime plaster surface. So typically done on a wall. So old school walls are typically made out of lime plaster. So as they put it up on the wall, as it's drying, they're actually going in with water based pigments and painting on the damp lime plaster surface while it's drying. So the vehicle is water, and then the binder is actually the lime present in the damp plaster. In the Renaissance in Italy, fresco was the favored medium for painting on church walls. And the plaster dries quickly, so you have to move quickly. Most frescoes used cartoons, which typically were quick were sketches done that they used as kind of a template because the plaster dried so quickly. So we'll take a look. Oh yeah, and only the portion that can be painted that day is prepared. So you just do it in almost like a grid-like pattern. And then joints are arranged along edges of major shapes to kind of hide the grid pattern that they end up having to use when making, when making frescoes. So we'll talk about Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel ceiling. This was, like I said, favored during the Renaissance for painting churches the insides of churches, their ceilings, and their walls. And probably the best known fresco paintings are those by Michelangelo on the Sistine Chapel ceiling of the Vatican. And he initially used, refused to paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel because he wanted to devote his time to sculpture instead of painting. But requests from the Pope was hard to turn down, so Michelangelo eventually gave in. And in his 30s, he would work on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel from 1508 to 1512. It was a really grueling process. It was complicated, especially considering Michelangelo had to construct a huge scaffold to reach the ceiling 65 feet off the ground. And so he encountered a lot of challenges, from the fresco plaster becoming infected with mold to his body aching from hours upon hours, which he devoted to work. So we're running out of time, and I will continue on talking about the fresco technique in the next video.